All right, back to work. Uh, we've discussed three of the five major characters uh, briefly in essential terms, Rourke, Dominique, and Gail Wynand. We're, we're crawling deeper down into the rat hole uh, um, to discuss Keating, and then one of the all-time great villains in the history of literature, the great Ellsworth Toohey. Oh, I said great, I mean a great villain. Uh, Peter Keating. Now, the essence of Keating's character, of course, is his, uh, his, that, he, that he's an abject, across-the-board conformist. And you talk about you looking up people in the dictionary. You look up the word conformist in the dictionary, you'll find Keating's picture there. Um, I mean, he is truly pathetic. But the, uh, and, 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 and I, indeed, at, by the end of the story, I think the discerning reader doesn't hate Ke Keating, uh, even though Keating does some horrible things. He practically murders uh, Lucius Hyatt. But by the end of the story, you don't really hate Keating so much as you feel sorry for him. I mean, hate Tui, but uh, uh, Keating just wants everybody to love him. He just wants everybody to, to like him. And uh, he says, pathetic. Uh, there's, there's a great dialogue. Some of Iran's dialogue in this novel is truly brilliant. Um, but especially it's like some of the scenes between, or early on between Dominique and Tui. Uh, when, during the, 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 the heyday of the anti rock alliance, um, when uh, Dominique says to Tui, Peter Keating, who at this point Tui is built up to the most successful architect in the country, she says, Peter Keating is, is mud clinging to your galoshes. And uh, Tui responds, that's in your style, Dominique. I prefer to think of Keating as a soul wagging its tail. Uh, you know, and the imagery here is unmistakable. You know, Keating's like a dog. You know, he's like, come here, boy. He runs over. You know, roll over, boy. Yeah. You want me to rub your belly? You know, and he's just, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, obedience, that kind of, you know, obedient loyalty uh, is very, very endearing quality in a dog. But in a human being, it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's just pathetic. Uh, which, and this, this is the, the, the and Tui's right. Tui, Tui's the one who speaks of the style of a soul, and this is the style of Keating's soul. Now, what I want to point out here today is that conformity, the, the essence of Keating's character, is, uh, is, a, is a direct application of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. The, uh, uh, a lot of people may not know who Kant is. Um, a lot of people never heard of Kant, but he is a certified member of the big three in the history of philosophy. In, 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 history, in history of philosophy, the, it's recognized the three most important and most influential thinkers chronologically are Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, 18th century German philosopher. They don't realize the big three is now the big four, and Ayn Rand bo belongs in that category, but eventually they will. Now, uh, how does conformity follow from, from Kant's philosophy? Let's take this one step at a time. Look at Keating's method of operation. Give others what they want, meet their expectations. Whether it's your professors, your employer, your, your mother, the, the critics like Tui, the taste of, of the public, whatever it is. Flatter, kiss up to, fawn over all superiors. He even codifies this toadying attitude into a formal principle. Remember, at, uh, uh, going back to Kiki Holcomb's party, uh, when Rock is discussing a, build, a possible building with Joel Sutton. Now, Joel Sutton doesn't think Rock's buildings, uh, uh, doesn't recognize Rock's buildings as great. What he does recognize is Roger Enright hired Rock. And if it's good enough for Enright, it might be good enough for me, because Enright makes money. Um, so Sutton is considering hiring Rock. And one of the things he asks him is, do you play badminton? Rock says no, and Sutton is seriously disappointed over this. And Rock says to him, "Well, why? Do you, do you think it would be a better building if I played badminton?" <laughs> um, uh, anyhow, Sutton wanders off, and turns out he up comes to, to Rock comes Peter Keating, who's been doing what secondhanders do best, namely eavesdropping. And he uh, he goes up to Rock and he says, "You know, Howard." He says, "That's not the way to do it." <laughs> You know, if you really want to go to cocktail parties and network and get clients like Sutton, that's not the way, the way you do it. You know how I would do it? 
and walks out and goes, oh, and Keating says, I would have sworn that I played badminton since I was a little kid. I'd have pointed out it's a game of, of distinction. It's the game of kings and the nobility. It takes a rare soul to appreciate badminton. And by the time, you know, he ha was ready to play with me, I'd have made it a point to, uh, to play, uh, you know, badminton expertly. So that's, you know, that, he said, that's, that's what you should have done. Rock's response is immortal. He says, I didn't think of it. <laughs> See, of course, he didn't think of it. It comes from an alien universe. He might as well, Keeney might as well just land it from Jupiter, you know, or from Alpha Centauri. In a million, if Rock lives to be as old as Methuselah, he'll never think of it. This is not the way his mind works. Uh, he's thinking about the building, not about kissing up to, to Stoddard. Uh, and so uh, Keating goes on, he says, he says to Rock, uh, he says, I, I, I'll give you a piece of advice, you know, free of charge. Uh, always be what people want you to be. I underline this in my text. This is a signature statement. You know, always be what people want you be, to, to be. So he talks about the style of a soul. In that one line, Keating reveals the style of his soul. Because if, if, if you conform to other people, if you flatter them, if you, if you give them what, what they want, they'll like you. They'll approve of you. They'll, uh, you'll, 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 be, you'll be one of them. You'll, 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 gain, a, you'll gain acceptance. Um, so this is the credo of the abject conformist, the man who lives by blind acceptance of the judgment and the standards of others. There's a, of course, there's a deeper premise underlying this, and that is uh, you should not follow, as a moral exhortation, you should not follow your own judgment. You follow others. Others, consequently, are the source of truth and falsity. Others, uh, that others are the source of truth and falsity regarding cognition, and what follows from that is others are the source of right and wrong in ethics. So the, the true and the good uh, come from others, and basically you just, ex you, you just accept them. Now this is the mentality, of course, that 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. If, uh, well, 50 billion, or, you know, however many, but that society sets the terms. The good is social. Uh, it's set, you know, that, that people, are, this is, people are raised in society, society has educated them, society has, quote, socialized them, uh, and consequently they've, they've imbibed the values of, of society and the good then is simply to act within socially accepted parameters. Um, now, w why can't 50 million Frenchmen be wrong? Because truth is social. Because right and wrong are social. Because reality is social. Now, there was a time when uh, God was dominant in Western society, right? The Middle Ages. Uh, and the idea, the idea was that you know, right and wrong come from God, come from on high, not from society. When did this watershed change take place, this, this idea uh, that uh, truth, right and wrong don't come from on high, they don't come from God, they come from society? Uh, Robert, your name's Roberta, right? Jen. Jen, that was close. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the, so the Renaissance and Enlightenment, certainly those were the periods when the West began its long, slow, gradual movement towards secularism and away from religion. You see the, the, the declining power of religion in Western culture and the rise of secularism, uh, which is, of course, what underlies the current world that we're in because our enemies are religious fanatics who hate us because of our secularism. And when Khomeini called America the great Satan, he meant it literally. Right? That we're, we're, not, we're, we're, anti, we're non religious, we're anti religious, we're essentially a secular culture where people are concerned mostly with making money and their sex lives. Um, but I think the key, the key 18th century figure, you mentioned the Enlightenment, the key 18th century figure uh, involved here is the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Now, if anybody who's read, now Kant is tortuously difficult to read, he's notoriously difficult to read. He's so difficult I, that I hear by word of mouth that, that today in Germany, doctoral candidates in philosophy who are studying Kant, these are native-born German speakers. Uh, Kant, of course, wrote in German. Native-born native German speakers read Kant in English translation, I hear. 
because the English translators tried to make sense out of Kant, whereas, whereas Kant in his major work, The Critique of Pure Reason, I think deliberately obfuscated his meaning. What it, what it needs to say about poets who muddied their waters to make them appear deep. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Kant performs what he calls a Copernican revolution in epistemology. And, I, and, I, and bear with me, because I think that it is necessary to do a little Kant and real, to really understand Peter Keating, to really understand the phenomenon of conformity. And epistemology, of course, is a branch of philosophy that studies how human beings gain knowledge, by what means, by what method. Um, and Kant's, uh, what he calls his Copernican revolution here, is his idea that the human mind has certain concepts, in, uh, structures built in, or filters, if, if you will. Uh, and maybe the, be maybe the best analogy for Kant is this. Imagine that we were all born with organically connected blue spectacles, not detachable, but you know, the part, of our uh, part of our biological equipment, and they were blue. Then we would necessarily perceive the world as blue. Because, not, not necessarily because the objects out here were blue, but because the subject sees the world through a blue filter, through, a, through a, a blue lens. So the subject then imposes the blueness on the world. And if you ask, well, what color is the world independent of the subject? The only answer would be, who could ever know? You can, you, these are non-detachable uh, spectacles. There's no, way to, there's no way to get them off. There's no way to get outside them to see what the world is in itself. Uh, it's a simple, a simple analogy, but that's really the essence of Kant's epistemology. In effect, the human mind has built into it certain concepts or categories by means of which we understand the world. One of those concepts is entity. So we, we necessarily perceive the world in terms of objects like this podium, or like these tables, or like the glass. One of those concepts is causality. So we necessarily perceive the world in terms of causal relationships. A person's exposed to germs, and consequently, he gets sick. Uh, the human subject applies this built-in structure to what's, what's coming in. What's coming in is just raw sense data. Yeah. Uh, so the human mind creates the world. It's, it's the, the world that we perceive is subjective. For Kant, Kant is infamous for what's the theory known as epistemological dualism. There are two glasses. There's the glass as it, in, as it is in itself, independent of our awareness. And then there's the glass as it appears to us. Um, the glass as, as the human mind has constructed it. So we are perennially cut off from the objective world. But we have created, and consequently are the master of, the subject world. We never know the world as it is, but we are the creator, and hence the master of the world as it appears to us. So, so the human mind, to Kant, is simultaneously both helpless and omnipotent. Helpless relative to the objective world, omnipotent relative to the subjective world. Um, so after Kant, the term objective Come, no longer refers to the world out here. That's unknowable. Uh, the term objective becomes the collective subject. That is the group as a whole, as distinct from one person. I'll repeat that because that's important. After Kant, in the modern world, in the 21st century, the term objective means the collective subject. It means the group, or the human race as a whole, as distinct from uh, an individual. So to Kant, reality depend, our reality, human reality, depends on the cognitive function of the human mind in total. Uh, since we're all human beings, we all have the same cognitive apparatus, we all experience the world in the, in, in, in the, in the same way. Uh, and the, uh, uh, what, what this means is knowledge has been radically subjectivized. The, the human world is the subjective world. Now, this is what Ayn Rand calls in her technical uh, metaphysics and her, her view of reality, her theory of reality. This is what Ayn Rand calls a social primacy of consciousness theory. I'll repeat that. This is what Ayn Rand calls a social primacy of consciousness theory. Now, the primacy of consciousness in general is the idea that reality depends upon some type of mind, some type of soul or spirit or consciousness. The clearest example, of course, is religion. Where we start with spirit. You start with God and then God creates the world. 